Um, I grew up in this little tiny town in the Midwest in Iowa. Um, I was very flat. It's like the surface of this little pitum. It, um, it's so flat that it's unusual to find even a slight hill. And the result was, I think, for me, and not only for me, I think this is maybe Iowa syndrome. I spent the rest of my life after leaving Iowa looking for places that had some kind of intensity and powerful taste and color and things like that. In this little town, maybe because of what I just said, there was um, a tremendous hunger for cultural activity, tremendous. Education and art, they were like really important in Iowa. So when um, an opera company happened to come, and I was about 15 or 14, I don't know, and they performed La Boheme, the whole town came to see La Boheme. So David Garo, you've spent a lot of time writing about the meaning of great works, either works that everybody recognized as great, like Sri Harsha's Nice Idea, uh, or the Manichori Tramu, or, or works that you have discovered and, and think that are great, and you, and you write about their meaning. What does it mean for a work to have a meaning? And who, who should be, uh, uh, who should have an adhikara, who should have uh, the, the right authority to interpret it? I mean, every work of art has some kind of meaning. It's really a question if we know how to read it or not, if we can hear and learn that meaning. And the atikara may reside in people who have not been trained in the full world of Sanskrit erudition, let us say, or, or in Telugu or in Tamil, but people who have some kind of sensibility that allows them to hear that, um, that meaning. Although I have to say it helps to have lived in India for long periods of time and to have learned the languages and to have somehow be in that milieu. Um, I, I'm happy that you asked about the Adhikara because I think there is a sense in which um, in our generation and also in the past generations, um, the art of reading these classical texts has been largely lost. And part of the loss comes from the fact that there are normative and prescribed ways of reading, especially within Sanskrit, but also filtering into the other languages, so that people, people look for the meaning of a work of art uh, through the prism of the Kashmiri Alankara Shastra which is a wonderful thing in its own right. There's no question about that, and nobody should think that I'm indifferent to Abhinava Gupta and uh, Ananda Vaudana. I, I'm not, I'm fascinated by their theories, but I think they don't really help us in reading the texts, including the very ancient texts and certainly the medieval texts. Um, so what does help, actually? That's the question, how does one know? I could say that most of my teaching, my whole life, has been in an attempt to somehow find, recover, usually together with people who are learning, you know, our students and colleagues and people like you, to recover those lost protocols of reading. And they have to be recovered because they tend to have been lost. Uh, to different degrees in the different um, literary cultures. So in Tamil, for example, there's a real break, a severe break, um, for all kinds of reasons that have largely to do with the colonial period and the colonial values that somehow superseded the traditional ways of reading. You could actually say, it would be only a slight exaggeration to say that the last thousand years or so of Tamil poetry, which is an immense literature, these literary masterpieces have been largely forgotten, with one or two exceptions, like the Kambaramayanam, the Periya Puranam. Uh, and because of the rediscovery of the old Sangam period poems, uh, so now, because antiquity became a value, that's a colonial value, um, people prefer to read those poems 
and they have lost the ability to read these amazing works that were produced in a continuous way over the last many centuries. But it's possible to recover, I think, those modes of reading and listening and understanding. Uh, if you read the text with some kind of patience, you have to know the language, you have to patiently read and keep asking yourself what it's trying to say. So I, I should say I have a bias in this because I tend to prefer the notion of some kind of uh, thematic and cognitive um, drive in the great literary works. I tend to feel that um, for example, in the Kuriatam plays that we're seeing, or in major works like the Naishadya, like you, that you mentioned, uh, or the Kambaramayanam, there's a set of themes that if you read with an eye to finding them, um, then the book will talk to you, and it will tell you what it is wanting to say, you know. Not in a didactic way, this is not kind of some didactic message, it's more some kind of exploration of a particular cognitive and thematic range. I could say that most of my life I've been, you know, trying to read like that and not alone but with the help of people who are close to me, Narayan Rao, for example, and, you know, and you, and others, yeah. so, so I'm trying, I'll, I'll push you on this a little bit, is meaning like a, is it like a fixed thing? Or is it also influenced by, by the uh, political and social context of the time uh, in which the work was created and the time in which the work was in, is continued to be interpreted? I mean, I'm thinking about your Tamil book and the kind of criticism it ran into in the modern uh, uh, Tamil readership that that has a different set of val values and a different protocols, uh, different set of protocols of readings than the ones you're trying to recover. So is recovery really the way to go about it? Uh, recovery is a metaphor. It's like recovering the Vedas when they were stolen by the demon Somaka and hidden in the bottom of the ocean. You know, It's an image of uh, some kind of rediscovery. And maybe rediscovery would be a better word than recovery, I don't know. Um, there's absolutely no question that the, all of these works, uh, they exist in a historical setting, I, of course. So the, in fact, even to put it in those terms is perhaps to create a false dichotomy. You can say there's the work and there's the economic and social and political uh, context and all of that. So as if there's the text and the, the context and these are two different things, but actually, it's not like that. The, the context is fully alive and active and embedded in the text, um, and also the other way around. So, yeah, one, of course, always somehow has to find some way to understand why it is, for example, in the 16th century that listeners or readers to literary works, but it's also true of music and painting and sculpture and drama and architecture, why the consumers of these products were also in many cases the authors of those products, why they were suddenly um, you know, offering something that was unprecedented, something entirely new, as if there were a shift in taste, in artistic taste. I think there was such a shift. And we want to understand why that happened and why this readership had somehow changed and who they were. Having said that, I also want to say that, of course, uh, nobody would ever say that they really understand the one and only meaning of Hamlet or of any of the masterpieces in these languages or in Sanskrit. Of course, the uh, meaning something that has to be invented, perhaps, again in each generation. But I think there is something to be said for our adhikara as people living today who are reading these books and finding that they actually do speak to us in a very, very powerful way. And the reason I can say that is because I know from my own experience in my body that I'm profoundly moved by what I might see on the Kuriyatam stage or by the books that I'm reading. I have a physical reaction. And I tend to believe that these physical reactions are good indicators of something that is really there in the text, you know, and so actually... It's like in the plays themselves. That's, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like in the plays because there too, they're going through all kinds of very physical reactions. And yeah, Emily, Emily Dickinson said this once. Emily Dickinson has a beautiful sentence where she says, you know, how do I know if I'm in the presence of a great poem? She says, I know it because my entire body is on fire and my head is as cold as ice. Is there any other way to know it? <laughs> you know, and I, I know what she means. That's exactly right. You know. There's a lot that you do that is also a political activity. Is there any relationship between your, your work, your political activism, yeah. and, your, and your scholarship? Or are they like two separate domains with a strict uh, bifurcation between yeah. them. I've never been any good at con compartmentalizing myself. I just, I'm not good at it. I know that some people can do it, but I cannot do it. I think that the work in the Palestinian territories is like watching Kuryatun in some sense. They belong together. Um, I can give you some examples. Um, Again, if you think in terms of the experience, what happens to a person, as you know very well, what happens to a person, let us say, in the Palestinian territory when, I don't know, uh, the soldiers are barking at you and threatening to arrest you, and maybe they are actually arresting you, and there's violence directed at innocent Palestinian people and at the activists. Um, Sometimes, not always, I and mean, it depends on how one responds, but suppose you stand up to it and you say no, you will not go along with what they're telling you to do. And there are moments like that. There's something in the inner experience of that. It's an involuntary thing, but you begin to feel good inside. You have a kind of sense of liberation. Even while being arrested, you feel free. That's, again, that other kind of knowing that is so interesting to me, you know. I mean, you could say also, uh, if you wanted to, you could say somebody who works in Indian materials and who has read Gandhi and knows about the Gandhian method and that, you know, that also has a part in what we do in the territories. It's a form of Gandhian style nonviolent resistance, you know, of course, on some level that's definitely there. And I think that Gandhi, um, he somehow amazingly created on an experimental basis this method and theorized it also and made sense of it. That's his huge achievement. Um, so that's somewhere, somewhere in the background, I think, of what I do. But I don't think it's the primary drive. But, but if we look at, at the scholarly side of things, yeah. I mean, this, this field is also uh, politicized to, to, to a great degree, and especially today in India, yeah. when, uh, when Sanskrit studies and the humanities more generally are so you know, taken over by dangerous politics. What, what is our role? As, as scholars in these dark days? So our role is to speak the truth and to speak the truth to power. And um, it can happen in all levels and sometimes in what appear to be rather peripheral places like the classroom, you know. But actually, uh, that's another thing that we've learned over the years from political activity. Um, you cannot calculate the consequences of what might, be a, might appear to be a seemingly minor and even irrelevant act of goodness. And truth is like that if you speak the truth. So truth also includes those protocols of reading. Reading in a non-mechanical way, reading in some personal way, um, reading with the humanistic values that are implicit in these sources and, you know, are accessible to us today. So, so in 16th century South India, for example, what, what, what are these, what do these humanistic values consist of? What, what primarily? So, uh, you know, to answer that, I have to sort of generalize in a kind of um, 
you know, sort of far-reaching way. I don't much like that. I'm always interested, above all, in the very specific and in the singular, you might say. But nonetheless, it's impossible to answer that question without saying something of a general nature. General means, I think that all of South India, at least South India, and maybe also beyond South India in the north, all of uh, the South Indian uh, linguistic cultural matrices um, shared a set of common features and were taking part in this shift in taste that I was talking about. The shift in taste is an indication of some kind of uh, systemic change. So we find these new themes and values in all of the literatures, if we want to stay with the literatures. That is in Telugu, in Tamil, in Malayalam, and in Kannada, in Sanskrit, also in South Indian Persian, and probably, although I can't say for sure, in Marathi and Oriya. So what are these values? For example, there's a fascination with the unencumbered individual, the person who uh, has left behind his or her um, ascriptive, caste-derived identity and is making a life um, on the basis of some kind of highly personal, idiosyncratic, very individualistic kind of taste. Um, there's things one could say about how that develops and why it develops to this point. You know, it's not, it's, it doesn't emerge out of nothing. It comes from a long background, but it becomes incredibly um, present in the sources. So if you read the poems of Anamacharya, of Annamaya in Telugu, or if you read the Tamil um, Naidadam, that is the Naishriya, or I think if you read the Malayalam, uh, so-called Manipravalam Shambhus, and in Kannada if you read uh, Ratnakara Varni, for example, um, and it would be easy to give many, many more examples. You will see there this uh, fascination with the, um, the recalcitrant, stubborn individual. Again, I want to say you can find things like that in the early literature. There's no question about it. Nonetheless, there's a shift in that, in that direction. There's also something to be said, I mean, since we're in the first half of the 21st century, I suppose I have to say, and I believe it anyway, that the, um, the gender balance has shifted and that there's a very rich and possibly new sensibility um, that relates to women and their imaginations and their actions and their feelings. Um, the fact that the Telugu Padams are, 90% of them, put in the female voice, that tells you something. And also that voice has a particular very confident uh, quality about it. Doesn't mean that women were living in some kind of liberated mode in the 16th century. They were not. But there's some imaginative uh, shift in the nature of these male and female voices, you know. Um, we also see it in Kudiyattam, you know. We, that's another area where this female voice is suddenly very very present and in perhaps a new way. Um, I should say that although this is Kuryatam's very ancient tradition, there's no doubt that it has lines going back to the very beginning of Indian drama, the Natya Shastra. But I tend to agree with Manu Devadevan, who has written in his dissertation and then later that he thinks that Kuryatam, as we now know it, crystallized in the 16th century. I think that's perhaps correct, and that includes the nature of those female roles and parts, you know. Yeah. Along with those ideas, there's a new kind of kingship, or actually several new types of kingship. So the, the traditional, what you could say, the uh, sort of very dominant Chola model of what a South Indian state looks like, that was clearly shifting in a new direction. And um, I mean, it's not always the same thing, and it's not necessarily even a universal thing at that time, but all of these states, the Nayaka kingdoms in the far south, 
the small Zamindari, Paligar uh, states in Andhra and in Tamil Nadu and in Karnataka, the incredibly fragmented Kerala political world of the 16th and 17th centuries where every time you cross a river, which is about every 15 minutes, you're in a new state, a new state. And these states have their own way of thinking about why they exist and what the nature of kingship is. In all of these areas, you can see that there's a new idea of what politics is all about. Um, it's there in the Amukta Malida in Krishna Devaraya's book. He actually explicitly thematizes it. So that's another area. Yeah. Situate us uh, in the home of a Karanam, in some village in the, I don't know, let's say around 1600. And uh, in his salon, what, what, what do you imagine was going on? What texts were being read? What kind of cultural exchanges, political exchanges, uh, stories being told, music being heard? Yeah. So uh, again, in a kind of very broad and generalizing way, I think you could say that um, this is a new elite. There should be no doubt about it. These are elite formations. We're talking about very sophisticated audiences. Um, these are people with at least some kind of knowledge of the tradition. That means um, they may not have learned the Amara Kosha by heart, but they know people who do know it by heart, and they will have heard it coming at them. And they will have had some training in grammar, either the Sanskrit grammar or the grammar of Telugu or Tamil, whatever it might be. And they will have some familiarity with the great books because these books are being intertextually quoted again and again by all the new books. They always have intertextual quotation, which presumes some kind of knowledge. Uh, they're educated, and they tend to be what you might call some kind of middle class, I suppose. Something like that. Maybe not all of them, um, because these texts a potentially a wide range, you know, of appeal. But I think the core groups of people who are in, just as you said, in a salon, we can imagine. Actually, we have em evidence about these salons, you know. We can actually say something about them, and we know who were there from a period a little bit later, say, 19th century Calvary Delta, or the late 19th century, the salons in, in Madras. And we know who these people were. Some of them were nouveau riche. They had gotten rich in a, a economy that had become a cash-based economy. Some of them had um, commercial contacts with people coming from outside these uh, foreign trade companies. Some of them got rich because they carved out kingdoms in potentially very wealthy places and you know, had the income, again, in cash. Um, so they tended to be moneyed people, I suppose. And they had leisure, that's another thing. These were people who had the leisure to read together one of the new Prabandham texts. Uh, that means most of them, these Prabandham texts, most of them can be read. If you read every day, let's say for three hours or two hours or something like that, you can recite an entire Prabandham or listen to an entire Prabandham, usually in less than two weeks. Which is, that's a new thing also um, in South India for sure. So. Um, these are people who were able to come to have tea, or maybe it wasn't tea, I don't know what they were drinking. Um, actually wine, if it was in the evening. They had time to come and sit in the salon and listen to these texts, some of which they might have composed themselves, among themselves, for themselves, for one another. Um, maybe every day, you know, and we have verses that actually tell you that, that explain what the life of a sort of literary uh, aesthete a man about town or even a woman about town, what it was like in those days. There's another thing, since you mentioned the Karnams, and I think it's very possible that these Karnams indeed were consumers of the new literature and music and art, you know. So these Karnams, they were literate, not in the traditional sense, that is an oral literacy, they also had graphic literacy. And also that's, an, I think, a new, a new development, and it's something that you see in many of these texts, really, maybe most of these texts, there's a sensitivity to the importance of what, to the act of writing, to the shape of the characters, and to um, 
the relation between the recorded written text and the memorized text. So these Karnams were literate people, right? So what would, what would be the linguistic situation? How many languages and which languages were, were spoken, understood, and composed in, in these situations? So let's suppose we're thinking about a specific place. Let's say Hampi, right? In Bijanagara, at its height, which is maybe 10 years before it collapsed. <laughs> Those are 10 good years yes. because that's when the Vitala temple, the most magnificent of all the Hampi monuments, were, were, was built. You know. So let's imagine these people. Who, who were they? Some of them were Amaranayakas. They were military commanders who were well-educated, and some of them were poets, as we know. Uh, and some of them were these merchants whose names we also know. You know, Cynthia Talbot did a prosopography of these people, so we actually have some idea of who these early, late Kakatiyas and then early Vijayanagaram period people were. Um, they were multilingual people. I don't think they were, among this group in the literary salons, let's say, that we're imagining, I doubt that there were any monolinguals at all. They knew Telugu, of course. They're also living in a Kannada-speaking area. They naturally knew Kannada. And they had to know Sanskrit or some Sanskrit. Maybe they were not experts in Panini, but they could understand Sanskrit. And some of them, uh, you know, some of them took pride in knowing Persian. For example, Srinatha is only 100 years before. Srinatha, in the introductory verses to his Bhimakanda, a wonderful text, he is talking about this um, uh, his patron, who was exactly one of these elite people, and uh, this patron, he could write in all kinds of, you know, he knew Nastalik, and he, he knew Persian as well as the North Indian scripts, and of course the Telugu and Kannada scripts. So that's, I think you'd have to say this is a multilingual environment. And I think that was largely the norm for the, um, you know, the sophisticated literary cultures in South India right up until the year 1956, which was a disastrous year in South India because in 1956, the Indian states were um, reorganized, divided on a linguistic basis so that you had a state for Tamil speakers and a state for Telugu speakers and so on. The result of this is that there's now, a, you know, in, it's a very short period of time, seven or eight decades, uh, in all of these states you have monolinguals or maybe they're Let's say they're Malayalam speakers, but they know a little bit of English, or maybe a little more than a little bit, and a little bit of Hindi, which they somehow pick up from the movies, or they learn it in school. And maybe a tiny bit of Sanskrit, but they don't know Tamil, and don't really understand Tamil, and they don't know Telugu or Kannada. These are like foreign worlds to them. You know, it's a disaster. The old you know, polyphonic and multilingual environment has been shattered except for the uh, border zones like Palakadu, where there are bilinguals, say Tamil and, and um, Malayalam, or in Rayalaseema, where you have people who speak Tamil and Telugu and maybe Kannada and so on. I mean, there are vestiges of the old multilingual um, aesthetic and, and uh, erudite environments, but it's fast disappearing, you know. It's a kind of catastrophe. <laughs> I want to ask you about music. It's, it's uh, not very usual that a person who writes so much about texts yeah. is also fascinated by and a connoisseur of uh, music. And you're very much into Carnatic music. You're, you want to write a book about it. You've, you, you've learned it. You sang it. How, when, when did you first uh, Come into, come into contact with Carnatic music and what did your body tell you at that time? Yeah, that's true. It was a bodily experience. I can tell you exactly when. It was in July of 1972. Eileen um, and I had just gotten married a few months before. We came to India, first time to India, on a kind of honeymoon tour. We were like backpackers, you know. We didn't have any money, but we somehow managed and um, um, we were about to shift to England because I had decided uh, rather against my own instincts that I was going to do a PhD in some South Asian field, actually in Tamil. For, again, accidental reasons, I'd settled upon Tamil. Um, and I wanted to see India before I went off to England to study. I just wanted to see what it felt like and, you know, the whole thing. So we came and uh, I mean, it was, it was hot, July, um, hot and humid and overwhelming, and um, we liked it. 
We liked really almost all of it, I think you could say. But when we came to Madras, and to me, Chennai is still Madras. I can't think of it in any other way. When we came to Madras, we stayed in the New Woodlands Hotel, which was then rather new, actually. It was actually new. <laughs> we stayed in the New Woodlands, about 100 meters away from the Music Academy. It was love at first sight, really, at first sight. We loved that, we loved Madras, and we loved everything about it. Uh, it was as if it had always been ours, somehow, both of us, Eileen and I. Um, Eileen might give a slightly more nuanced description of this. I think she would. But uh, since you asked about the music, that we, began to, we went to concerts and we heard Carnatic music. Um, and although it was strange to the ear, as was Tamil, by the way. Tamil sounded like something that was not even like a human language. It sounded like, you know, some strange, I don't know, language of the, of the birds or the, or the gods. I don't know, something that didn't sound human at all. So it was strange, but somehow very compelling. And we came back, we bought a few, uh, you know, 78 LPs. That was what they had in those days. We brought them home in our suitcase. And, uh, you know, we had, when there were some Carnatic um, Kacheri, things like that, and uh, we used to listen to it. And it moved me tremendously. The whole thing moved me. Everything about Madras was moving. The food, we loved the food. We loved the people. There was some fantastic thing about the people. We even liked the weather, even though it was unbelievably hot and humid. Everything had that kind of dense, thick, you know, texture, which is the texture of Madras. So the, you know, that was, that was, I think, our initiation into Carnatic music. And then when we came back to Madras to live there, it was in 1976, we lived there during the winter months um, in Mandavali Pakam. So then, uh, again, through a series of coincidences, Eileen began to study Carnatic music. She's very musical. And she very rapidly went through the first three or four years of Carnotic uh, exercises and scales that people learn at the feet of her teacher, Ramu, uh, Tirupur Ram Ramu. Um, and she, um, she very quickly began to sing Barnums and then actually Kritis and to perform with her teacher in temples. And uh, they didn't have a common language. Ramu knew almost no English. Eileen didn't know any Tamar at all, but uh, somehow they communicated through the music. So then hearing it, hearing Eileen sing like that, um, you know, those were among the deepest moments in my life, I think. And uh, so it was, and also I should say, my guru, John Marr, taught me Tamil. Uh, among the many things that he was expert in was Carnatic music, which may be, even now, he's in his 90s, may be the very central driving power in his life. He loved the music. Actually, he loved everything about the Tamil country and Tamil language and Tamil people, but above all, the music. So it was very natural. I was four years with him, you know, it was somehow very natural that the music would also be a part of my own life. There's one other little autobiographical thing I maybe should say, which is that um, it, when I was really a young boy, like in between the ages of literally five, and about 15 for those 10 years. So I was a violinist and I also learned piano, but I was mostly connected to the violin and that was the center of my life. Um, I wasn't so good at it, but I, I loved it and I was composing music and without knowing very much, I was composing music and I listened, of course, to a lot of music. I, I think that that I mean, afterwards, that got submerged under all kinds of things. Or rather, you might say that interest in music, it kind of mutated into uh, an interest in languages and their musicalities. I think it's the main, the main thing that I look for and yearn for when I try to learn a language. I want the music of it. And also, in reading texts, I keep listening for the music, you know. So... One last question. Yeah. Uh, so you you came back after your PhD. You came back to Israel. Was it 79, Six, 76, 76, 
And ever since you've been living in Jerusalem and you basically, if you don't mind me saying so, founded uh, Indian studies and South Asian studies in, in Israel, it's a major project. What can, how, when you look back at that project, what, what do you think? Uh, above all, I think I was extremely lucky. It was just some kind of amazing luck. Um, the luck that allowed me to find my way into South India, Tamil, and then Telugu. And then the fact that the university wanted somebody to teach about India, you know. I, I mean, it was a little bit easier in those days, I guess, university appointments. Even so, it wasn't so easy. But there was a job waiting for me. Um, and also because at that time India was very much uh, kind of on the periphery of the humanities in the university. That is, they wanted a person who knew something about India. And they recognized, I think, that Sanskrit was important. Um, but otherwise, they left me and uh, you know, my colleagues who began to arrive. Professor Sirkin, who came from Russia, and later students who got jobs, you know, students who had begun with me and then came back and began teaching Tibetan, that is Yael Bento and Yohanan Greenspoon, who went and did a PhD in philosophy, and you came back. That was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me in the academic world. Um, so we were left to our own devices. Nobody interfered, nobody tried to tell us what we had to take. There was no such thing, basically no such thing as credits that were a kind of currency, that like today is, if you go to the university and a student registers, he gets a number of credits and they count as money. And all kinds of uh, distortions take place because of that. In those days, you could take as many credits as you wanted, and if you did, you know, two BA worths of credits, in your three or four years there, that was no problem. You would be able to keep these credits for the EMA. And, you know, and, and in fact, that was the norm. Most of the India students, they tended to be a kind of self-selecting group of people who were passionate about it and actually loved doing it and very good at it. Most of them did that. They learned all kinds of languages and they studied. And, and there was no, there was very, very little interference from above. And I think also, um, gradually it became a part of the Hebrew University. I, Sanskrit and Indian studies generally somehow became part of the intellectual landscape and assumed its rightful place, which was waiting for it to happen in any case, I think. Because the links between you know, that med piece of the Mediterranean, this place on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean in India, those are very powerful links. You know. So I think that that has happened. So along with the Judaic studies, and along with classics, and um, Assyriology, of course, and the linguists who are studying languages. So Indian languages found a kind of home in Israel. On the one hand, it's a bit of a, a, an unlikely story. But on the other hand, there's a natural quality about it. And, I was blessed with these fantastic students and colleagues. A lot of your, a lot of your uh, work, in addition to writing all these books and original essays, consisted of translating from Sanskrit and Tamil and Telugu and other languages. Would you like to share a verse with us and like offer a running translation? <laughs> yeah. Um. I can, um, I can bring, I'll bring a verse from the Naishadhiya, which is a challenge, just as an example of the kind of way I like to work. Uh, I've spent a lot of my life translating things, often with the Velcheru Narayanara and others, um, and with you. Um, I have to say, I, I always tell my students that actually Languages are usually impervious to translation. Even a very simple sentence, like, 
I came to Muriculum to watch Kuriatam. If you say it in English, or if you say it in Malayalam, it's not the same sentence at all. So I'll read a verse just to show, you know, it seems, I don't actually, the truth is I don't like talking about the theory of translation. And every time I see a translated volume in which the translator has a long, boring introduction about the art of translation and how impossible it is, I know the translation will be no good. <laughs> I'm for, I know for sure. So instead of talking about it, we'll just, uh, here's just one verse. So this is from the Naishadiya, right? So actually you can open the Naishadiya at random. Every single verse you pick, any one of them is going to be some fascinating tour de force, some amazing verse. Um, and they're amazing because of the musicality that I was talking about and also because of that unbelievably rich intertextual world that he brings to bear and also because of the very weird and peculiar diction that he invented. And so here's a verse that actually comes very close to what we were talking about before, that bodily knowledge, that non-cognitive or extra-cognitive or metacognitive cognition, you know. And here's a verse. So I'll tell you the setting. Um, this is um, the famous goose who is about to become a love messenger between Nala and Damayanti. And the goose actually uh, offers a theory of speech, of language, and of the uh, you know, what, what he, the goose, can or cannot do. And Nala, who is pleading with this goose to go to Damayanti and to tell her that he, Nala, is her proper husband and he's in love with her and all that, he says then to the goose, he says this amazing verse about why the goose is going to be the perfect messenger. As he can tell because they've been having this conversation in very abstruse Sanskrit, <laughs> right? Here's the verse, it goes like this. Akilam vidusham anavilam suhreda cha swahreda cha pashyatam sabidhe pina sukshma sakshini vadanalankriti matra makshini. So, usually a Sri uh, Harsha verse, uh, when you first hear it, you don't understand anything. Then when you hear it a second or third or fourth time, or you sort of crack it open, then it looks obvious and immediately intelligible. So, here's what he says. Uh, I'll give you a rough translation of it. He says to the goose, he's in Allah speaking, he says, everything is lucidly perceived by those who see through the heart or through a friend. Suhrida cha swahrida and the opening now looks very clear. Akilam vidusham anavilam. Akilam, everything is anavilam, perfectly, lucidly clear. To somebody who can understand vidusham. Everything is lucidly perceived by those who see through the heart or through a friend, because the goose has now become a friend. And then he says, the two eyes that sit on our face that can't detect anything fine, sukshma, however close it comes, are only there for ornament. Eyes, you know, it's good to have eyes, they see things, but they can't see the subtlety. They look good on you. They look good on you, they look good on you. But even something that is right in front of your eyes, you may not actually really see it. You need a lot of, some kind of luck really, to be able to see it. Actually, you need to perceive it through your heart, or through the words of a friend, or the presence of a friend. That allows you to actually know what you're looking at. I think, you know, that's an amazing uh, statement of this thing I was trying to, you know, somehow suggest earlier about that other kind of knowing. And it's kind of nice to find it in the Sri Harsha verse. It's like coming to one of those friends. Yeah, no, it's, it's good that that option is there because uh, uh, for us, you have been that kind of a friend. <laughs> thank you for saying that. Yeah. Thank, you for, thank you for talking to us and, and sharing some of your thoughts and for all, that, all these conversations over the years and may they last many more years. May they last many more years, thank you.